What's going on, everybody? This is Black Men Sundays. I'm your host, Corey Sylvester Murray. We're talking about generational wealth. We're talking about finance. And of course, we're talking about business. It's a Black Man Sunday. Time to put all childish things away. I refuse to be the man I was yesterday. Gotta put my best foot forward and elevate. And before we introduce today's guest, my man Eric from Huntsville, Alabama, who do you have for our Black Men Sunday Spotlight? Hey, thanks, Corey. Man, my spotlight is real simple today, man. Um, basically, we just going to focus on the NBA draft that we recently had. This is the first time in history in the NBA draft that all the top picks were done by had black agents. Isn't that what's up? My second one was about LeBron James. Now, LeBron, a lot of people don't know this, but some people do. Man, LeBron is still doing his thing. He has provided three to four bedroom homes for unprivileged kids and families so they have somewhere to stay. A lot of people don't know this about LeBron. A lot of people hate on him. But man, LeBron is a star to me and I think to everyone else on and off the court. So that's basically my spotlight today. Now back to you. Well, I like that spotlight, man, for sure, man. And Eric, you know, you be coming through, man. How's the uh, small town of Hunts Vegas doing these days, man? Man, Huntsville is just growing and growing and growing, man. It's, you know, we're number two now. Number what two. Mean, number two as in the smallest one. towns in the country? What you mean? No, nah, we're the number one. We're the number two city to stay in, to live in overall for, you know, for wealth, for uh, crime, uh, industry, you name it, man. Las Vegas is where it's at. So, yeah, definitely, man. Got I... And then it's also home of Alabama a and University, the number one um hbcu in alabama and in the country so what can you say you know i kind of agree with the first part but i mean you don't you don't jumped off the bridge because you know them fam you rattlers we running things we got a and t on here too but i'm gonna say fam you running the show you know what i mean fam you and howard because the reverend dr bracy passed away i'm gonna give howard some love but typically you know it's fam you all day every day so i appreciate yeah. that eric and nice hat by the way man you looking fly over there man let me get a hat let me tip it off to you I see you. I see you. So now it's time to introduce today's guest. We have Richard Page Jr. When we talk about the Rich Page, what is that? We're going to find out what it is. We have the founder today. This brother has a Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering. This brother has a Master of Science in Systems Engineering. We're going to talk about STEM. We're going to talk about identities. We're going to talk about youth development. And you know we're going to start off with generational wealth. So, but before I do that, uh, Richard Page, how you doing, brother? Welcome to Black Men Sundays. Very good. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited just to meet with you, brothers, and to just throw around some ideas. Um, I'm, I'm I'm looking to to gain knowledge uh, from you guys, guys, as well as share um, some of the things that I've learned in terms of uh, developing wealth, and uh, and more importantly about passing on generational wealth, which I have learned the hard way, is not something that we in the African American community um, have really had the opportunity to generate until basically my generation. So I'm excited to be here with you. Definitely, brother. Welcome to Black Men Sundays. Let's go on and get started. You're the founder of The Rich Page. What is The Rich Page? What is that? The Rich Page is my organization that has opened up opportunities for me to go in to speak with, with other organizations, be they uh, nonprofit organizations, even churches, uh, businesses, and share with them the ideas of developing identity, true identity, shifting the idea that your identity is based on your income, uh, that your identity is based on where you grew up. All those things are aspects that go into your identity but they do not determine who you are. The money that you make and the job that you do do not determine who you are. So that's kind of the, the main idea behind the Rich Page. When we talk about defining our identity, you know, a lot of brothers' identity, like if we're at the bar after work on a Friday night, you know, brothers are first thing out their mouth is their name and the company that they work for and the title, Right. So when we talk about defining your identity, first off, I want to take it back for a second, because for me, I feel like the identity that I 
when I was 18, when I was 21 and me and charismatic were going to Norfolk, going to shadows, that identity then and my identity now, as far as wealth building, but as far as career, as far as likes and dislikes, just overall, I feel like my identity has changed. How do we identify our identity? But then on the second level, if we see, is it possible that we can change our identity coming from a teenage to a mid forties level? I would say this, and that question comes up all the time. And I think it's an excellent question because as you said, when we're young, our identity is really based on society. Our identity uh, comes from, or, or what we think is our identity, I should say, comes from, am I wearing the right clothes? Am I wearing the night, the night, the right sneakers? I mean, I'm, I'm a kid, actually, I was a teenager in the 1980s. I'm, I'm 56 years old. So um, it was, it was converse. It was, um, this was before Jordans came out. So, so those are the things that define, or, or at least you thought define who you were. What were the clothes you were wearing? Were you wearing um, the, the Converse uh, All-Stars? Um, what music did you listen to? Uh, and what did your teachers say about you? Uh, were you a thug or were you a nerd? You know, all those things you think define who you are, define your identity. Then just as you said, as you get a little bit older, you start coming into more of a, a into what I would call a better realization and understanding of who you are, your identity. What is it that really defines you as a human being? And I think the first thing you need to recognize is that I'm a human being. You know, as a kid, you don't think about that. It's just, yo, man, what team do you like? I want to be like, and again, I keep on going back to Jordan because in the 90s, he was the man. You know, nowadays, we have different superstars. So I, I keep referring to, to Jordan as being the man in terms of in terms of athletics and sports. And so you want to be like Mike. In other words, you want to be identified as someone that played, not only played basketball, but also was identified as a winner. And that was the thing about Michael Jordan. He was the one that personified championship in the 1990s. And that was what every every boy wanted to be identified as. I want to be a winner like Mike. I want to be a millionaire like Mike. I want everybody in the world to know who I am. So what you can do is you have the opportunity, once you understand what identity is, what truly identifies you as a person, to write a different story about who you are. And I know, guys that has shifted their identity. They grew up without a father in the house. Mom is working two and three jobs. So they have the, op the opportunity to identify themselves as a thug who makes money by, by, rip by robbing people. Again, I, I knew people, I grew up in Brooklyn um, in a neighborhood called the do or die bed sty. So I knew you either identified yourself as, as someone that went out and took what they wanted or someone that tried to do the right thing. And I know my, my boys that grew up in that, in that single parent household, they made a decision as to who they were gonna be identified as. Am I gonna be a thug and probably die or go to jail by the time I'm 18, 19 years old? Or am I going to change that, that, that narrative and identify myself as someone that stands up for good principles? So you can change your identity. Definitely. And let's talk about corporate identity. You know, we talked from the personal perspective, but, you know, the person I was 18, I was cool with delivering pizzas, running. But now it's kind of like, now nah, I want to sit in the AC and make make some bread. Like, I'm not trying to go crazy, but I'm just saying that was just a little slide, sidebar example. Yeah. <laughs> but um, from a corporate perspective, is it possible to change your corporate identity? And what are some effective ways of doing so? Yeah, uh, man, that's that's a really good question. I tell you, um, Corey, in in starting out, um, in my first corporate job was I'm what am I, 22 years old. I'm a I'm a new engineer. I got a brand new degree, and I'm just happy. I'm just so happy to be doing engineering. I love airplanes. I was I was just such a nerd, and so all I wanted to do was what they told me to do. But the some of the old guys on the job talked to me about 
establishing my own direction and my own identity. And, you know, for the first couple of years, I'm not even thinking about that. I, I just want to be known as someone that was intelligent and someone that was that did good work. That was really all I cared about at that point. But as I got older and as I got more experienced, I began to shift my identity. I started to realize, wow, I, I don't want to just be known as someone that that does what their boss tells them to do. I want to be known as someone that's an innovator. I want to be someone that's known as a problem solver, not just a good kid. So uh, the way I was able to do that was whenever an issue came up, I volunteered myself for it. Whenever my boss asked me to do it, I said yes. Even if I didn't know that I knew how to do it, you better believe I found out. And so what it did was it shifted my identity from just someone that was a good worker into someone that could actually be a leader. And to this day, I still talk to my um, talk to my boss. I worked with him for 13 years. He retired in 2003. I still keep in contact with him. And he always tells me, he says, Rich, if you had stayed, you would have been one of the VPs. But I decided it wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to do something else. So you absolutely have the opportunity to shift your identity. Even in the corporate world, you don't have to get stuck in the box that they put you in. Definitely. And when we talk about planning, specifically strategic planning, you know, because this show, we're big on um, generational wealth, finance, and business tips. So can you give us some tips? Sure. Um, I, just what you said is strategic planning. Um, too often, young people get a job. And with that job, all they're thinking about, and again, if you think about it as a teenager, as we were probably all teenagers that had a little job, you're making a couple of dollars and you think, oh man, I'm going to get, I'm, I use the word fly. When I was growing up, that was the word. I'm going to get fly. You're thinking about the shoes you're going to get. You're thinking about the outfit you're going to get so you could go out to a club or whatever. And that's where your mind is. <laughs> I'm going to make the money so I could get fly. But when you get a little bit older, you start recognizing that, okay, that was okay when I was 16, but now I'm, I'm 25 and I really need to start thinking. I, I need to, that doesn't mean that people do it, but that's what we need to do. And you need to start thinking, if I invest even just a little bit of money at this point, but I do it on a consistent basis and I put that money away uh, in terms of investment, I take money out of my paycheck consistently and I don't deviate from that. That money, even if you don't do anything except invest it well, it will pay dividends for you um, decades down the line. Um, the other thing is you can get more aggressive. And again, the old timers on my job, uh, I, I'm a good listener. I love listening to what the old men would tell me and they would give me such great advice about how to be prepared for retirement. When you're 22, you're not thinking about retirement, but they would always tell me, Rich, you need to start thinking about retirement even right now. And they told me about guys that were successful at doing that because they had invested their money for 40 years of work. Definitely. And um, as I prefaced, you have a Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering a master of science and systems engineering. So when I think of engineering, off top, I think of STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Do you believe there's a difference in students that have more of a STEM background versus the creative artistic backgrounds? Yes, I, I do. I think so. I, you know, sometimes I kick myself because I don't have that, that creative flair that uh, my, one, one of my brothers, he's a music teacher. He, he's retired now. Uh, my son is a gifted songwriter, guitar player. He's one of those guys that that gets you upset because he could grab any instrument and start playing. And, and I don't have that at all. <laughs> so uh, I think that there is a big difference. I, 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 I love to see there are some people that they can kind of bridge the gap between the two. They're, they're really good in, um, in science and math. And at the same time, they can play music or they can draw. 
Um, so I, I think that there is a difference, but I do think that there are people that that have both gifts together. And I think that when you do, when you are able to marry those gifts, you can do some phenomenal thing. You can touch hearts, you can expand minds, because it's like being able to speak a different language, English, Spanish, Japanese. You can talk to anybody and make things happen. What about the brothers that may have had an issue on the job? They may have had a high profile job. As I spoke of in the intro, they may be at the bar talking about the job and the career and their title. But then let's say something happens. Let's say, you know, new management comes in. They bring it on new people. He does something wrong and gets let go. Um, you know, when we're talking about jobs like that, um, how does the identity how does your professional or corporate identity change when you have an adverse effect happen to you? Something like that. Oh, bro, I, I'm, I'll tell you something, brothers. Um, that happened to me. This is not something that I heard about or read about or studied. No, this happened to me. My um, my job, I, I worked in Seattle for um, about 10 years. Uh, and what happened was they wanted the group that I was working with, Flight Operations, to move to move from Seattle down to Southern California. That's one of the reasons I'm here in California now. And so what happened was at the time I said, I don't want to move my family. We don't want to move to, to California. Ha ha ha. Now I'm in California. <laughs> and so what happened was they said, well, if you for the people that don't want to come, you can either find a new job here in, in Seattle or just take a layoff. So I took a layoff and I said, I'm going to branch out and I'm going to start my own business. Well, I didn't have a strategic plan for starting a business. So that means my business never got started. And what ha what I noticed what happened to me was, and just like you said this, the first thing that people ask you when they meet you is, what's your name and what do you do? What's your job? I don't have a problem with my name. <laughs> that hasn't changed. But I couldn't say anymore, oh, I'm an engineer for the Boeing company. I, I couldn't say that anymore. Um, and I'll tell you what, man, it it messed with me. It really did mess with my mind. And then I, I came down here to Reading. And so now I'm looking for a job, just a job. It was not a career anymore. My career was gone. I'm looking for a job. And so I worked for a just a couple of places like part-time, anything I could get. And again, they would ask you, they would ask, well, well, what do you do? And I told them, oh, I'm working part-time at XYZ. And I'll tell you what, and I've shared this with my wife and many other people, it really messed with me because it showed me that my identity was tied up in the title. It's great to be able to say, oh, I'm an engineer with, with X company XYZ, this is what I do. And people get impressed. But what happens when you don't have that job? What happens when you don't have that title anymore? What happens when you're not uh, revered in that particular profession anymore? Or, or just to say um, that you're unemployed or you're between jobs, as a friend of mine <laughs> said, you should say. So um, what it taught me was that, again, my identity, and this is one of the things that I preach all the time, your identity is not tied up in your vocation. In best results, your vocation should be an outflow of your identity, but your vocation does not determine your identity. So there are teachers with a certificate. They went to school, they got all kinds of stuff, but they're not good teachers. <laughs> so you're a teacher, but you're not a teacher. You just got a certificate. Nobody's learning from you and you're not encouraging anybody to learn. Or you could be a doctor and not a healer, right? Or you could be somebody's mother and, and, and be a great healer, but you're not known as a physician. Oh, you heard something? Go see Mrs. Johnson. Ms. Johnson will take care of you. She'll make you feel much better and encourage you to go on. So that's what I mean. Your vocation does not determine your identity until you come to an understanding of that here and here you're gonna get messed up because everybody's job ends. The champion of a box of, in boxing, why do you think boxers keep on coming back to the ring? Of course they wanna make more money, but at the same time, it's hard to put away that championship. It's hard to say, 
I, I was the, the, the WBA championship of the world, and now I'm not anymore. Great information, man. My man, uh, Kalal, you have anything? I, I'll, I'll probably jump on the uh, youth development, but I'm going to let my brother get some get some love right quick. Go ahead, brother. Do you think that there is a such thing as a generational identity? And how does that generational identity feed into how we operate in society, how we move? Is there ways for us to redefine what that generational identity might be? How do you feel about that? Yeah, wow, Kalali, I, I think that that's excellent. That's a great question. I think so. If you just look at the at the African American experience, and particularly African American, uh, and I say that because our experience here in the United States is different from Africans in the in the continent of Africa. I've had the opportunity to work with uh, in my job. I supported airlines in Kenya, in um, Ethiopia. Uh, and in Rwanda and in several other places. And they've come here and they've asked me questions. I took them out to dinner. They met my family and they asked us questions. Why do you Americans think this way? Because they've not experienced the things that our generations have experienced. So I was born in 1966. We all know that that, that generation of those people, my parents was the generation of people that did not have the opportunities that we have now. You know, my father worked two full-time jobs so that he could purchase the house that I grew up in. These were the people that, that, that this is interesting, uh, a, a, a brother in a church that I attended in Florida told me that he went uh, up north to Connecticut with his family and they drove down in the car. And he said, he said, Rich, here's what we did. We fried chicken. We had it in the bag, we had sodas and whatnot, and we put that in the bag and we drove down. And he said, I never thought that I, why my family used to do that. Now, again, you guys might be too young to have experienced that, but my family did that too. He said, now I know why. He said, because when our parents did that in the 50s and 60s, they couldn't stop at McDonald's. They couldn't go to the bathroom. They had to go to a place that was marked black. So generationally, their identity were people that were struggling for an identity as American citizens, as respected American citizens. That was that was that culture's identity. This is the Martin Luther King era that we're talking about, where they were struggling. He with through his leadership, they were struggling to develop an identity that is worthy of respect. They wanted to show the world and the United States, we deserve to be respected. Not only are we human beings, we're not just human beings. We are intelligent. We are strong. We are capable. We are able to mind, manage our finances. All we don't have is the opportunity in the country that we've gone to war for. Mm. Now you come to the later generation. Again, now, now my generation, born in 66 now, we're the generation that had opportunity mm -hmm. uh, because of what my father did. He he worked, he saved money, he bought a house, he, bu he bought books. My, my house was crazy full of books. He loved science. So he passed that on to me and my, my brothers and my sister. Now you have today's generation, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. They have all the opportunity, they have all the stuff, but they don't have a hunger they don't have the hunger that our parents' generation had. They walked for miles. They didn't take the bus because we want to show those people that they can't they can't run this bus system without us putting money into it. Mm -hmm. My generation was able to ride the bus and I put money into it. This generation, they won't ride the bus because they'd rather ride in the car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, to answer your question, and I'm sorry, that was long-winded. But yes, I do believe good. that there is generational identity. Yes, definitely. Now that that's all good, because I mean, just like you talking about your experiences, you know, speaking with you know people, uh, you know, speaking with Africans. So I'm I'm first generation immigrant. My parents are African. My parents oh. are from Ghana, West Africa. So, okay. You know, so one of my identities is like trying to bridge that gap, right? Trying to bridge the gap between 
what we think of as a distinction, right? African versus African American. And now that's become, you know, in this generation, that's become sort of a heated conversation, you know. Um, and so one of my identities is to say, no, nah, I'm a child of the diaspora. I mean, I'm a child of, you know, I'm a child of all the African, you know, all the African identities and traditions. And one of the things that I um that I wish we could, you know, we could forward to people is letting them know that even though the experiences are different is rooted in a common history and a common struggle. You know what I mean? And if we can figure out how to pick up that struggle, you know what I'm saying? And, and understand the lessons from that struggle, then whether you in America or you in Africa or you in Haiti or you in Jamaica, we all still have something in common that we can offer to each other. So, you know, that's really interesting. I, I heard you talking about, I heard you talking about how you, uh, you know, you tried to become an innovator uh, at your job as opposed to just somebody who's a good worker. What do you think are some lessons of like innovation just coming from your just coming from your experience like um what were some lessons that you learned about how to innovate um i think not being afraid to to make a mistake mm. um you know painters artists musicians those guys are amazing i, I would have jam sessions jam sessions with my brother he played the guitar my father brought me a drum set and we would just play and we weren't worried about making a mistake um, but when you get to like business, we're scared to make a mistake and you can't mm. innovate mm. without being willing to step out and do something different. That's what innovation is. You're doing something that hasn't been done before. What if you're afraid that you're going to make a mistake? You won't do anything. You're just going to stick with the book. Um, my boss uh, asked me to to do something and, and there's a standard way of doing things, but I said, you know, I want to do things a little bit differently. So I went online. Um, you know, when he started, there was no online. <laughs> so I went online. I went to the NASA website and I found some information and I started using this tool that was available for free for download on NASA. And I remember he came to me, he said, Rich, how did you get this answer? And I said, oh, I used this tool from NASA. He said, Where'd you get that from? Why are you using that? You can use this program. And I said, I know, Tom, but but this is from NASA and it has a little bit more information and it's much easier to use. And he was like, oh, OK. So, I mean, I know how he is. He likes going by the book, by going by the standard process. But if you prove that what you're doing is not, not only as good but it's better than what's currently there. You've innovated something new and people have to take take notice of what you're doing. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And there's a there's a gem in there, that gem of that gem which we've heard, you know, several times on this pod before is is, is to not be fearless and take it. I mean, to be fearless and taking that step out if you're trying to, you know, innovate and create a new organization. And I do feel that a lot of us, you know, don't take that next step or don't build that business or don't go for that promotion or don't go for that next step because of because of fear. Oh, what if I make a mistake or or the imposter syndrome? Right. What if I am I'm not good enough or, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. So, uh, you know, I hope people pick up on that gem right there, even through the stories that you've already told us and, and just what you just said right now, you know, to be fearless, you know, uh, to not be afraid you know, uh, of taking that next step out there. When we talk about fear, because I've heard brothers say, you know, I had a bad, you know, I went to speak to my boss about a raise, didn't go well. I got a, I got demoted instead of a raise. You know, they were having issues where they may be waking up four or five in the morning thinking about the task at hand because they may have had a failure the day before. So they're thinking in their mind, they're waking themselves up in their sleep, like, I can't afford to have another failure, another failing day. So what advice would you give for brothers to be able to, if they're in a career or they're at a job where they may have made mistakes, but they are trying to be fearless, but certain errors, you know, you hear you hear their boss say, hey, if you mess up one more time, you out of here. That creates fear off top because now you have to be perfect. So what's your advice to brothers that, you know, may have a great job, may have a great title, but they have that fear when they go in every day. Yeah, I, you know what? That's real. Uh, I'll tell you the, the truth, and I don't. I, I tell people this to um to to destroy it in my own life. 
I, I have a tremendous fear of failure. I don't like making mistakes and and um and I don't want to fail. You know, when I play basketball, you know, in Brooklyn, you have to play basketball. <laughs> you know, or else you have no identity as a man. <laughs> so so I would play basketball and I always felt like I was a bad shooter. So what does that do? I'm afraid to take a shot. Now, but you know how it is in basketball. If you don't score, all they look at is how many points did you score? So if I'm not hitting shots, I, I I feel like I'm a loser. So what I learned to do was I learned to I learned to pass a lot. So if I'm not selfish, then all of a sudden I'm okay. Yeah, I'm not hitting I'm not hitting a million points, but I'm giving it to the guy that's hot, and that's okay. So uh, what you can do is if you understand why why have you made mistakes, why have you gotten in in trouble. And on a career level, if this is if you're dealing with it with a business or even with um even if it's not so much of a career, and your boss have noticed maybe they they put the put gave you the finger, hey man, this is it. You done messed up so many times. We're losing money. Normally, when your manager or your leader says that to you, it's because your mistakes have brought heat on them. And what they're really trying to do, they're trying to save their own net. So what you can do is you can go and you can talk to them. Hey, man, look, look, I, I know I've made a couple of mistakes and I don't mean to bring heat on you. Here's what I'm trying to do to make things better. Normally, bosses just want to know, do you have a plan to get things better? Are you a job guy that come in late um, every day? You, you take two hours for lunch when your lunch is half an hour. I mean, what can you do? to really make yourself better so that with the mistakes that you make are minimized. Yes, I made some mistakes and they were bad mistakes, but you know, I'm good. You know, I'm putting in a hundred percent for this company. So I'm going to fester. I'm going to own up to my mistakes. Yeah. I, I counted the, the packets wrong. That was on me. I'm sorry about that. I'm going to do better next time. I'm going to double check my counting or whatever it is. Let them know. One, I own up to it. And two, I have a plan to make things better. And three, I recognize that this is bringing heat on you. And I'm going to own up to that. And I'm going to do better by you. You spoke to us about, you know, your identity in terms of like, or losing your identity in terms of like, you you had a job and the job title itself was your identity. So when you were divorced from that job, and that job title, you you didn't, you know, it kind of messed with you in terms of what's my identity now. And, you know, in the conversations that I've had uh, going through my life and just talking to different people, what we have tried to do. And I think this is something actually that this generation has actually been very good at doing. This later generation has been good at doing is instead of saying, hey, you know, this is my job title. We look at the skill set we bring. What's the toolkit that I bring? You know what I'm saying? So like for me, I could say, okay, my toolkit is, you know, I'm a public policy analyst. I'm a strategic thinker. I'm a great public speaker. I'm a basketball junkie. I'm a political junkie. And how can I bring those things, that skill set to the job and sell that skill set to make things better at the job? So if you could just elaborate on that, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, that that was excellent. Just in the question, you you said it is. I think the first step in doing that is uh is is identifying is recognizing that skill set. And and too often we don't do that. Like you said, we we jump right into the job title. I'm going to apply for this job as a aerospace engineer. Well, wait a minute now. What are the required um skills that are necessary to do that job? Um. I, again, we also look at things like, well, what school did you go to? Did you go to Harvard or did you go to Howard? Um, you know, and so, oh, and so some people uh, can almost be be traumatized because they went to a small school instead of a big school. That has nothing to do with who you are or even how great your skill set is. Um, the point is that whether you're in in music school. They're teaching you how to develop not only um, your ability to play music, but to be able to think musically. And in engineering, it's the same way. They teach us how to think a certain way. And what I've learned, and just like you said, after I didn't have the job or the job title anymore, I start, and I do this all the time now because I recognize it in me. 
Um, what are the things that I enjoy about engineering? I love um, playing with numbers. I love understanding how things work. That's been since I was a kid. I love to understand how things work. And it doesn't matter whether it's a, uh, a bicycle or an airplane engine or, or politics. <laughs> I love to listen to people when they talk and understand how they're thinking and see if I can figure out um, what they're going to do next. It's like writing a program that, that figures things out. You, you give it an input and the computer gives you an output. And that's what I do. I, I, my input is, what did they just finish saying? And now I'm going to try to figure out what they're going to say next. And, and all of that is because I understand my tool set. Um, so thank you very much. That was that was a great question. It was very well spoken. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> nah, thank you. Definitely thank you for, for for being on the show. I you know I, I really like you know where you're going in terms of you know trying to um, help people understand you know what their identities are and how to maximize their identities. Um, and you know ultimately I think that looking at you know those kind of things and then kind of what we're talking about here in terms of your skill set um can allow us to understand what our what our true value as human beings are you know the job puts the the title on us and then says okay this title is assigned x amount of dollars you know what i mean and we say oh okay that's my value but it's like no your value is what you what is intrinsically in you and your skills that you can bring and 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 how you can capitalize off that you know what i mean so 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 yeah so you know keep doing keep going on your journey man I, I appreciate you coming and talking to us uh uh and if you want to elaborate on that a little bit you know uh uh feel free to do so just in terms of how we can capitalize on our identities to 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 actually uh you know make more value for ourselves yeah that that's excellent i think you know that's kind of the point of what we're talking about is one once you understand your identity, who you are, what your skill set is, what you bring to the table, then you also need to recognize, well, you know what? I, I'm worthy of some amount of, um, of, of financial um, uh, provision. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when you get a job and people say, oh, you're engineering or you're a doctor or whatever, you must get a good salary. When you think about it, though, and it took me a long time to get to this place. I've always been happy with the money that I made. I thought it was good. But then you think about it and like, OK, if they're willing to give me this amount of money, they must be making a whole lot more money. <laughs> and so the question is, if I didn't work for them and they determine how much they're going to pay me, then wouldn't I be able to determine for myself what my value is? and be able to, to, to be paid by someone directly. So, um, so doing that and understanding your, your skill set and understanding what is the market value of your skill set um, outside of the company. Because again, the companies kind of conspire <laughs> and say, this is what we're gonna pay this guy. And, and when you step outside of them and you come to an understanding that really um, your value is limitless. In, in reality, your value is limitless. And like we talked about generational wealth in my father's generation, again, he worked two full-time jobs to buy the house that I grew up in. Um, and, and he was an operating room technician. He was an operating room technician. And this guy had to work two full-time jobs to buy a house. Mm. Come on. Um, mm -hmm. Now his son, me, I'm able. I was able to work one job. I had the opportunity to go to college, blah blah blah, and I was able to purchase a house mm -hmm. uh, myself. And you see how times have changed, and 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 because of what that generation has done to open doors of opportunity. Now what we should be doing is, and again, I, you guys are a bit younger, but. But for myself, in speaking to young people, I was a youth pastor. I still speak to um, to, uh, to to teenagers trying to, to to shift their mindset, stop thinking about getting a job and develop yourself, develop your own business so that you can establish your own financial resources and develop um, something that will last you for a lifetime. So do something that you enjoy and utilizing your own skill set and get paid 
to do it. That's not a job. Awesome. 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 Appreciate you. This conversation about like, we could talk another hour just about identities. Like this conversation about identities is deep because identity, our identity, what we think of as our identity is actually what, what, uh, causes us to put a cap, you know what I'm saying? On what we can do. Like, like he just, I mean, he's been dropping gems. I don't know if people picking them up, but he's been dropping gems. Like when he talks about our value being limitless, like this is one thing I say, and then I get off, like, you know, um, I got a financial advisor. My financial advisor was like, look, you know, one of the things he asked us was like, look, he said, so what do you think is your your biggest investment? Like, what do you think is the most valuable investment you got? You know, in terms of your, in terms of what you, what you own or whatever. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm thinking, okay, well, my house, you know, that's, that's what I, you know, that's what I owe the, owe the most debt on. <laughs> <laughs> And he's like, nah, you know what I'm saying? He was like, nah, he was like, he was like, yeah, that's, that's what most people answer. He was like, nah, he was like, he was like, your biggest asset is you. He said, because you can get infinite amounts of value out of yourself. So that's your biggest value. So this is from a financial advisor I got. We actually had him on the show. It's my cousin, Simon Dogbe. Maybe you throw that back, but you know, so him just saying that just dropped that jam into me. So what you're saying, Richard, with where you're coming from with identities is really just connecting with me. So that's all it is, man. Just trying to, you know, just vibing with the guests. <laughs> Can I say this real quick? Yeah, Share say what you that, want. Again, real. This is real life. I went to um, um, I was I was taking over accounts for um this guy who was my lead. He was he was letting go of his um East um East African accounts. And giving them to me, so he took me on a, a tour with him, and we went in Kenya, uh, and um, and we and so we had finished the day's work, and we were out out someplace, and they were just having some beers with with some of the guys at, at from 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 one of the companies in Kenya, and uh, and I will never forget this man. I was I'm the new guy. I didn't know anybody. I was just quiet, just listening to everybody talk. Um, the guy that I worked for, he's um, a white gentleman, but I just loved him. Just a great man. And um, and with 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 several of the uh, of the Kenya uh, employees and um, and this one guy, he was a um, this guy was a um, a, a lead pilot um, for, for this airline. And he was and he was a white gentleman. I thought he was from South Africa or from England, because normally they would bring in someone from from Europe to help train their pilots. But that wasn't the case. It turned out he was actually born and raised in um, in Kenya. So he considered himself a Kenyan. And so they're talking about, about Africa, the continent and talking about Kenya. And this man said something I had never heard before. It blew me away, just what you said. He said, here's the problem with the rest of the world. America, Europe is the problem that I hear all the time when people talk to me. He said, people think that the value of Africa is in the gold and the diamonds and natural resources. He said, but that's wrong. He said, the value of, of Africa is its people because its people are brilliant and they're powerful. And I wish the rest of the world would understand how valuable African people are. This is from a white man. I, well, I was sitting there. I had to hold back the tears from my coming out of my eyes because I'd never heard of that before. Well, that's that's a whole <laughs> that's that's a whole other conversation, right? I mean, you know, four hundred years ago, or whatever they knew the value of the of Africa was the people, right? That's Come why on. they transported the people Come from on. one continent to another, and they used it to build a country. And that country is the most powerful country on earth. So anyway, see now you done got me on something. <laughs> now you done got me on something else. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to say, hey, keep going. <laughs> Nah, man. <laughs> and, and, and we're gonna have, we, and we're gonna have that conversation. We, we're gonna do a whole hour on that conversation. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole. We're we're here to talk about generational wealth. That's a whole different conversation. Yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely, man. No, no, no. Great input, brother. And before I let you go, first off, Richard Page Jr., are you enjoying yourself on Black Men Sundays, brother? Oh yeah, yes, definitely, definitely. Oh, this is what a great conversation. I I don't get the opportunity to have this conversation as much as I would like. So I want to say thank you so much. Definitely. For, uh, yeah, it's been excellent. Thank you. 
Definitely. And I want to, uh, before I let you, I have two more questions. The last question I already, I kind of already asked you that, but I'm gonna ask you again though, but I want to talk about, uh, youth development, you know, as we talk about this generation, you know, they don't want to take the bus. They want cars. I've seen kids, sweet 16s getting, you know, hundred thousand dollar cars, $50,000 gown. Like that looked like a wedding dress and she just <laughs> turned 16, you know, and but with your engineering uh, expertise, I see you've uh, spoken at conferences held by Boeing and other companies. So when we're trying to stimulate to the youth, what advice would you give and what advice did you give when you were at those conferences? I always try to encourage people to understand um, our educational system throws knowledge at kids and expects them to catch it. But you really need to sit down and give them an opportunity to um to to receive it and to show them the value of it. Again, we talk about value again. Kids don't they they don't value knowledge. They don't value the knowledge. But when you just show them, I mean, even something like like playing basketball, you can program a computer nowadays. Have you ever seen those mechanical things to shoot a basketball? So well, how does it do that? It, it's, it's, there are really simple um, equations that will determine how a ball flies based on the amount of force that you put on it. So show them things like that. That's fun. That will make them say, what? How can, it, how can a machine shoot a basketball and hit three-pointers every time? Well, I mean, it's the same thing Steph Curry is doing. <laughs> you know, I mean, bring it to them in a way that that's fun for them to understand it and show them the value of it that way. And those guys will run with it. Definitely. And how do we encourage the youth to be interested in engineering as a career? Because a lot of kids tell me, listen, man, I like, in, I'm a mentor in our community here oh, in Orlando. Man. And I hear kids say, ah, engineering's cool, but man, that's a lot of school. Where's a lot of math. That's a lot. It's a lot going on. So how do you, or how do we as black men, but you as the expert, I mean, you have a master's in systems engineering with a bachelor's in aerospace engineering. How do we encourage students to get involved and get excited about engineering? It's um, showing them that you're not missing anything. It, it, finding out, okay, who are you and what do you like to do? There are a lot of kids that are really sharp in math. They can do computer programming and those types of things, but they're not encouraged to do it because they're afraid that people will laugh at them. I mean, you know, I, I know what that, what that was like, but I was fortunate because I love sports so much that I would also play basketball. So they would see this little guy, I'm the, the smallest one out there. They know I have good grades, but because I was one of the boys, it was okay. So they didn't mess with me. I didn't have a problem. And and by showing, by allowing kids to be a normal kid, just let them be a no, let them run around and play. Let them run around and have fun and do the things that that make them happy, that bring out the joy. Because again, I, I know how much I love rockets, how much I love airplanes, how much I love math. And my parents didn't stop me from doing it. They didn't force me into it, but they encouraged me to do what I like doing. And because I hung out with my friends, my boys never messed with me about it. They were cool with it. So I think it's really just letting people be themselves. Just just let the kid be themselves and they're going to they're gonna grow in it because it's the thing that really turns them on. Okay. And lastly, okay, now I've got it. Let's talk about that. Okay. So that's my book. And... Is kind of what it looks like. Okay, now I've got it. And the idea is, as I have here, it's about um, understanding your personal identity and value. And the idea is, uh, I've spoken to a lot of people. I've, I've been a youth pastor, um, and I've spoken at conferences, not only for youth, but uh, for couples, as well as engineering conferences. And one of the things I've found out is that um, people are upset and have issues because they don't know who they are. Uh, and so in this book, what I do is I, I go back to the very beginning. I'm, I'm a person that believes in strong foundations. And so I go back to the beginning. What did God say in the very beginning when he created the first man? 
what was it about? Was it about the color of his skin? Eh, it really wasn't. <laughs> was it about the job he was supposed to do? Ah, that was part of it, but that wasn't it. So I talk about all of those things in, in, in going through, um, first off, my personal story, why I needed to come to really know who God is and how that has changed my life and given me an understanding of who I am. I'm a child of God. I'm someone that loves God. And because I know God is with me and I'm with God, I can do anything because my value is uncalculable. Definitely. And where's that book? Where can we get it? How can we get uh, it? How much? Where is it? You know, it's on Amazon. You can um, easily order it on Amazon. And again, just the title is OK. Now I've got it. And I, there are no other books with that title. So it was easy to find. <laughs> or you can look at my look at my name, um, Richard Page. And you'll find the book. It's uh, $17.99 uh, on paperback. And I think it's um, $7.99 on, uh, on Kindle. Okay. Well, there you have it. There you have it. Richard Page Jr. Thanks for coming on Black Men Sundays, sharing a lot of great information. Like I tell all our guests, you could have been anywhere talking to anybody, but you came on Black Men Sundays and blessed us. So thanks for your information. Thanks for your time. And uh, definitely thanks for your wealth of knowledge. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been great um, talking with you, brothers. I'm really, really excited about what you guys are doing. And uh, I got to make sure that I that I definitely hook up with all of your conversations because this knocked my socks off. So I can't wait to see a lot more now. Thank you. It's a black man Sunday. Time to put all childish things away.